I think you've got a fan club here. Hey. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Kathleen Hicks. I direct the International Security Program here at CSIS. And it's my great honor with Beverly Kirk, who always stands to the side, unfortunately, that we are uh, able to host you here for Smart Women, Smart Power. Um, we are celebrating our fifth anniversary this year, which we're excited about. It's our first event of our fifth anniversary year, so thanks in particular for coming to this one. And we can't think of a better way to mark this anniversary than joining forces with our aerospace security project and Todd Harrison, who I think is right here in front of me, sorry, who directs that program to welcome retired U.S. Air Force Colonel, former NASA Space Shuttle Commander Pam Melroy, for a conversation about innovation and the role of government in commercial space. Just a few social media reminders. Please make sure you're following us on Twitter, and we're at Smart Women. And also be sure to check out our podcast that Bev hosts, and that's on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to good content. And if you're live tweeting, please use hashtag CSIS live, things I never thought I would have to say in my life. Um, <laughs> if a fire alarm goes off, also please follow my instructions. I'll be in the room with you the whole time. Our speaker series is made possible through the generous support of City. City, thank you so much for being our founding sponsor, particularly in this, our fifth year, and for helping us to amplify the voices of women in foreign policy, national security, international business, and international development. And please help me uh, to welcome Candy Wolf, who's the Executive Vice President for Global Government Affairs at City. Well, thank you, Kathleen, and thanks all of you for joining us today. Um, I'm really excited to kick off our fifth year anniversary. We've been such a pleasure to really uh, sponsor this program for the past five years. Um, and I must say that over the, uh, if you've been in the room, apparently they've been running a video with uh, many of the distinguished uh, guests that have been here in, in the last five years. And we've had a lot of impressive women, but we haven't had many astronauts and colonels. And now we have one person who encompasses both a colonel and an astronaut. Um, so I want to thank uh, Colonel uh, Melroy for being here and for setting the bar stratospherically high <laughs> for us to start the year. Someone wrote these remarks, I will note, and put a lot of puns in related to uh, <laughs> space. Um, and at City, we are proud uh, to be a leading global bank. And while we do not have a presence beyond planet Earth um, that I'm aware of, we are present in 100 countries. So we talk a lot about uh, the distinct business advantage that our global footprint offers. And we believe it gives us a unique advantage on the challenges and opportunities in the myriad of economic and political climates around the world. In fact, uh, just prior to getting here, um, we had a long discussion about Iran and the Middle East, uh, given our, our business footprint. Um, and so often we're faced with the need to confront the challenges daily in our mission as we try to provide financial services that enable growth and economic progress around the world. And so we are very pleased to present this series that bring women leaders in foreign policy and national security and the business community together to have a dialogue that talks about many of the pressing issues that face this world. And so I want to thank you all for being here. And I'm so excited to hear from Colonel Melroy. And I'd like to turn the floor back to uh, Dr. Hicks. All right, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Colonel Pam Melroy. She's one of only two women ever to command the space shuttle. She's also a retired Air Force test pilot and previously served as deputy director of the Tactical Technology Office at DARPA. That sounds way cool. Today, she, <laughs> she is an aerospace executive and the CEO of Melroy and Hollett Technology Partners, a consulting firm. Our moderator today, as always, is CSIS Senior Associate and Smart Women, Smart Power co-founder, Nina Easton. Nina, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Kath. Um, how many here were completely intimidated by this woman's biography as I was? <laughs> okay. Thank you for being here. This is thank such you, an honor. Um, Colonel, may we call you Pam? Please call me Pam. Oh, great. Right. Yes. So you've, all, you've wanted to be an astronaut, it sounds like, from day one since you were born. Right. I was, uh, my entire generation of astronauts, I should say, was very inspired by Apollo. And, um, you know, I think within a year of the first moon landing, I was telling everyone that I was going to be an astronaut. And 
uh, even in high school and in college, um, it was pretty much the second thing you learned about me after my name, right? And, <laughs> I'm going to be an astronaut. And to get there, you crossed through the Air Force. Tell us just a little bit about that. Well, at the time that I made this decision, all the astronauts that I knew about were military jet test pilots. Uh, so I decided I would be two. Uh, although women were not allowed to fly in the military until I was in high school. So really, truthfully, I was just born at the right time that the doors opened up um, in front of just a few years in front of me every step of the way. Um, Sally Ride flew uh, just as I was going uh, to start my master's degree, and she was a scientist astronaut. And um, at the time, I thought, oh, well, that's interesting. I could also get a PhD and go this way, too. Uh, but at that point, I was um, actually interested in being the commander. So <laughs> I decided to, to stay with flying and fell in love with flying uh, in pilot training and uh, absolutely adored it. So that made a lot of sense to me. Uh, then uh, went on to become a test pilot, uh, which was a fa fabulous job, uh, and then eventually was selected as an astronaut. It sounds really simple. Believe me, it was, it was not. not. Yes, it was going to say. It did not go that smoothly. So while you've had this extraordinary astronaut career, you're actually interested and are here today to talk about the future. And mm -hmm. um, that's what we're going to be talking about. And as somebody who, um, myself, I've uh, had the honor of interviewing a couple astronauts. I've got a couple um, top space people I'll be interviewing this year, which forced me as a generalist to get informed. Um, because this is an issue that I've, this space exploration is something that is, it's clear it's gonna be defining the next decade. Um, let me just um, read to you a couple, um, from a couple clips. Historians may look back at the 2010s as the decade in which commercial space flight really took off. Um, and this from The Guardian, space missions of a startling variety and ambition are scheduled for launch this year. Um, we're talking about a focus on the moon and Mars and deep space. Mm -hmm. Um, we're talking about, uh, as, as a lot of you in this audience knows, um, pioneers, innovative pioneers from the U.S. and beyond, but from the U.S. Um, who are leading the charge, like an Elon Musk, mm -hmm. like, um, uh, uh, like a Jeff Bezos with Blue Origin and Elon mm -hmm. Musk with SpaceX, like, of course, not from here, but Richard Branson with mm -hmm. um, Virgin Galactic. So we've got all these kind of big innovators associated with this. So uh, I think it would be really valuable for us to get up to speed on this mm -hmm. um, truly defining moment in our history. Um, tell us first about, let's start with the moon. Mm -hmm. So um, from what I understand, these, these, there's scientific experiments and technology that is going to help NASA put boots on the moon by 2024, that's not very long from now, mm -hmm. and establish a sustainable human um, presence on and around by the end of the 2020s. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, and it's, just to remind you, it's 2020 in case you haven't <laughs> moved your calendar. <laughs> tell us, yeah. tell us what you see. Yeah, it's uh, really interesting. So, you know, I think the framework, at least the way I think about it, is of course, we went to the moon and Apollo, uh, but um, I always compare Apollo to, um, if you're familiar with the Norwegian explorer um, Thor Heyerdahl and Kontiki, right? So that was, um, Thor Heyerdahl wanted to prove that it was possible using primitive technology that South Americans could have actually populated um, the Pacific. And so they built a balsa wood raft and proved that they could cross um, thousands of miles of ocean in it. And, and in a lot of ways, Apollo was the same. Very primitive technology by today's uh, standpoint. And it was a camping trip. They had to take everything with them and pack everything out. And it was pretty much what would fit in the smallest possible um, weight uh, and consideration because everything had to be launched uh, for a very long distance. There was so much we didn't know about humans living in space, about microgravity. Uh, the absence of gravity in low Earth orbit, you can do any kind of science uh, that has ever been done, and there's a lot to learn about um, material science, combustion, the human body, and so forth. And so um, the shuttle was built and the space station was built so that we could learn more and have um, really understand how humans need to operate in low Earth orbit. But for at least a decade, maybe two, um, 
inside the space community, there's been a real urging, like, haven't we learned a lot enough? Can't we push back out? Can't we go beyond Earth orbit again and, and, and go to the moon? And uh, so here we are. I mean, it's, it's certainly been discussed for a long time, uh, but I think there's a real focus on it now. And what's interesting is as we see uh, the space station going to sunset sometime probably in the next decade, uh, the rest of our international partners are all like, what's next? What are we going to go do? Because uh, we built the space station as a part of an international consortium. Mm -hmm. And so everyone is eager to try something different, and the moon is very tantalizing. And among those countries, are there, is there one leading country, aside from the United States, that stands out in your mind? Well, it's, uh, that discussion is really just happening right now. So the European Space Agency um, just had their ministerial and said that they're uh, committed to it. JAXA, uh, the Japanese Space Agency, uh, Canada, and Australia have all signed on. Which is interesting. Australia is a new partner, not a part of uh, International Space Station. By the way, um, and we're going to get to yeah. Pam's uh, business life in a little while, but you basically commute to Australia <laughs> these days. A little bit, yes. <laughs> um, um, t talk about the, the Artemis program and it, the role yeah. of the moon in that pro what it is and right. the role, how important lunar um, yeah. exploration is in part as, as that. So the key word in the description that you read was sustainable human presence. So not a camping trip anymore. Okay. So this is about going and it's about um, uh, tapping into both the scientific potential of the moon itself as a place to do research, uh, but even more importantly to prepare ourselves and practice when you're only three days away from Earth instead of six months. So practicing- Six months um, in Mars. To Mars, practicing to go to Mars. So it's practicing to go to Mars. I mean, I've read that there's, there's also exciting things going on like heavy manufacturing in space, possibly at the moon, um, and also deploying energy sources. Right, back to Earth. yeah, that will be very interesting to see whether the uh, energy sources in space, uh, how that unfolds. Uh, the Chinese have committed to a solar space uh, project where they will collect uh, the rays of the sun in space and then beam it back to Earth. We'll see how that, that unfolds. Um, that's been a dream for a long time. Some of the technology has some real challenges with it, particularly the beaming uh, technology. But yes, extracting what's called in space ISRU, in situ resource uh, utilization. How's this that for a buzzword? This is why the general <laughs> public doesn't know what's going on like, because you guys use all these that? acronyms. Okay. Well, the idea is, um, and the numbers vary, um, but it's incredibly expensive to launch just a single kilogram of rocket fuel. Because remember, when you go to the moon, you got to bring everything, all the rocket fuel you need to get home as well, and the same thing for Mars. So it would be fantastic if you could figure out how to extract rocket fuel where you are, in huh. situ. So um, when early explorers came to uh, the US, they had natural resources where they could build houses, maybe build more ships, and so forth. Not really having a lot of that kind of resource on the moon, so we have to be focused on what can we make out of lunar regolith, and can we extract water from it which is rocket propellant, it keeps humans alive, it supports can scientific we, experiments. Can we do that though? Um, yes, I think we, we, there's okay. enough science to show that it can be done. Um, we have a long way to go to get there. Um, you know, for one thing, if you stop and think about extractors, excavators, um, we use combustion engine mostly for that, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's very, got high energy density. We can't use combustion engines on the moon because there's no air. So we have a lot of, of, in particular, the energy solutions have to be sorted out. And so these are energy sources that are um, directed at our space exploration as opposed to energy sources that can be useful to Earth. It's gonna be a long time before it makes sense financially to take uh, the trip back to Earth. For the same reason it's expensive to get things from Earth to the moon, it will also be expensive to get things back. So if you can uh, extract rare Earth metals, for example, which um, are in abundance on the moon, huh. that might be a bit, there might be a business case there in the future. Okay, the Lunar Gateway, explain to us what that is. So I talked about the camping trip, right? Well, one thing we've learned from the International Space Station where we keep six people alive full-time doing sci a lot of science 
is that it's a very heavy logistics enterprise. And in fact, that's what really led to, um, in, in my view, the explosion of commercial space in the United States because NASA was struggling under the burden of the logistics to get stuff to and from the space station. And so uh, NASA made a decision to see if commercial companies were capable of developing the capability to transport cargo to and from the space station with the retirement of the shuttle, um, after, after the retirement of the shuttle. And so um, the logistics problem um, is even more serious for the moon. So one thing, uh, if you see pictures of the space station, you will see that it is right up to the gunnels with um, supplies and equipment all the time. It's very crowded, their things are packed behind walls, but also bungeed all over the floors and walls and ceiling. So we're gonna need a logistics cache near the moon where we can hold um, in reserve and build up everything that we need to support humans and science on the moon. And so that's what Gateway's going to be for. Okay, so then, and then let's talk about humans. Um, so the prognosis is the first woman and the next man will be on the moon within four years. And what's really exciting, we know the woman. We don't know which one, uh, but it's going to be a current NASA astronaut for sure. I mean, there's no likelihood that a, a class just graduated actually, uh, but you're gonna want somebody who's senior, has a lot of experience in space, and so when you look at the NASA astronaut core, one of those women is gonna be the first woman on the moon. And how big exciting. is that core? Um, it's, or the pool it, of people that yeah, they it's pretty, from? Yeah, it's pretty small uh, right now. The, I think the total astronaut core is about 50 people, and I believe there are 12 women, but I don't remember if that includes the class that just graduated. So give us a peek at what they look at besides your experience, aside from the obvious stuff, the, the psychological traits that they look for. Yeah, I think all that happens during uh, selection. Um, I, I tell people who want to become an astronaut that the interview is a little bit like interviewing with your prospective in-laws. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're going to be part of the family forever, and, uh, and you really are. And, and so, um, you know, you have to stop and think about questions like, who would you want to go to the moon with? And so, um, uh, especially interpersonal skills are highly val valued. Uh, so if you get to the interview, you've proven you have all the technical skills. Um, it's those, so, so this is um, un, not surprisingly an outgoing, um, friendly, helpful, supportive group of people. I was evolutionary there. Um, I feel like, you know, I kind of lived my life that way. I just dreamed about being an astronaut when I was 11 years old. And I don't know that I would have become a test pilot if I hadn't set that, that dream. So it's the same kind of thinking. So I love that big aspirational thinking. But I know you've got to keep into Mars, but remind our audience that I just, I want to encourage you, so please uh, write your questions on a card and we'll pick them up and you can join the conversation. So, um, but Mars, I mean, there's talk of colonizing Mars, but there's, I mean, it's, it seems like there's, <laughs> there's definitely a trajectory towards Mars beyond Elon Musk. And when I talk yeah. to you, you, you seemed excited about the potential. Oh, I'm very excited and the, I think so the way I think about it is uh, that we have this one planet. Um, and how I see this one planet Earth is uh, from space. And it was crystal clear to me, as it is to anybody who's flown in space, that Earth is a spaceship and we are the crew. And this is all we got. We got to make it work. We have to work together. The things that happen on one side of the Earth affect the other side of the Earth. Um, and it is an incredibly complex system when you look at meteorology, when you look at geology, when you look at biology. So one of the things that's very exciting to me about Mars is it is a second data point for me that we don't have. In what way? It's a completely different set of geology. It's a completely different meteorology and very exciting. There is some evidence from a meteorite that was originally from Mars, that was found here uh, on the Earth about 20 years ago, that shows- In, in Antarctica. In Antarctica, okay. exactly, okay. which turns out to be a great place to collect meteorites for various physics reasons. Um, uh, there is evidence that there was forms of microbial life on Mars. 
And uh, now with the NASA rovers that have found water on Mars, particularly subsurface water, the idea that we might actually find life that formed off our planet and the incredible insights that we will get about our own planet and our own biology from being able to compare those things. To me, the discovery of life on Mars uh, is something that, wow, I don't know. Um, if we send people, I think we'll have a better chance of finding it for sure, because people can travel longer distances, do their own analysis in situ, and so forth. So, so let's drill down yeah. that a second. In yeah. your personal opinion, what are the odds of finding life on Mars? I think they're pretty high. Um, I mean, not little green men, right? Right, right. <laughs> um, uh, I think it would be astounding if we even found something as complex as like an algae. Um, but I think my microbial forms of life, yes, I think there's a very good chance that we'll find them. Okay, and then what, and then walk us through why that's important to us. Well, the, um, one of the questions you might have asked is, well, how did they know that meteorite in Antarctica was from Mars? Yeah, that's well, a good question. Yeah, too. well, <laughs> so it turns out that every planet has its own unique chemical signature. And so by uh, cutting open this meteorite, and especially looking at gases trapped in uh, bubbles in the material, uh, they can actually determine, oh, yep, that chemical sequence, that's unique to Mars. So each planet has its own, uh, its, its own ecosystem in, in that its own chemistry. And so we expect to see the same thing in biology. And uh, from that, I think that some of the fundamental ideas about um, what life means and how we sustain it, I think it, it, it is going to have a big impact. And of course, biology is an area that we're learning so much already now. Wow. And you think about genetics, right? And so you're looking at different genetic markers. That's a good comparison. Yeah. Um, and by the way, why Antarctica, the physics of why meteorites <laughs> get there? It just, it just happens. Out there. Well, first of all, it's also a great place because if a meteorite does come in, it's a big ice field. And so it's not going to get churned. It's going to stay there and be pristine for long periods oh, okay. of time. But then there's also some tectonics that will actually allow certain places to collect large numbers of meteorites in, in one specific region. Got it. So... Um, the, um, well, we also have this, this issue of commercial um, enterprises taking yeah. tourists up in flight. Virgin Galactic wants to fly paying customers to and from suborbital -orb space um, in the spaceship too. What do, what do you make of that? Uh, I've always thought it was exciting. When I was a NASA astronaut, we had the space shuttle we were uh, talking about Orion, which is the lunar spacecraft, and the Russians um, had a Soyuz. Pretty much it. That was it for human spaceflight vehicles. And within a decade, to have dozens of ideas about ways that we can take people to space, suborbital, um, it's, it takes less energy to do it. It's only a five minute trip um, in, in, in space, but that's. Turns out you can do a bunch of science. You can actually have a great time too in five minutes. Um, so, which is you know where the tourists come in, I think, and maybe yeah. teachers and and uh, and some other commercial enterprises. Um, so, if you look at the number of vehicles being uh, designed, Virgin Galactic, uh, SpaceX, Blue Origin, um, and uh, of course there's work going on around the world and a lot of interest in future vehicles as well. And you have, uh, so Boeing, I should mention, with Starliner oh, Boeing, and SpaceX yes. with Crew Dry yes. and Dragon, they're, they're essentially becoming a taxi service for the space right. station. Right, so those correct? are the kind that. of the big dogs, right? Okay. They're going for orbital, and they, um, NASA made this decision about cargo uh, more than 10 years ago, and it's been enormously successful. Um, so commercial companies, um, right now, it's um, what was uh, orbital, Orbital ATK and now Northrop Grumman and SpaceX are routinely taking cargo to and from uh, the space station. And uh, Sierra Nevada uh, is also interested in that and is engaged and has a contract with NASA for the future. Um, the idea was then, gee, this is so successful. Could we uh, 
take low Earth orbit transportation off NASA's plate uh, and, and develop that capability commercially. So Boeing and SpaceX are developing spacecraft to do that. Uh, so pretty exciting. So it's interesting that space exploration fell out of favor for a while, manned space or mm -hmm. crewed space, I should say, non-sexist, crewed space exploration mm -hmm. um, fell out of favor for a long time. Um, but now it's not only, it's almost less public opinion than it is a lot of money driving this, a lot of investment in commercial vehicles. Right. Why is that? What's the... What's yeah, the I, What's it's the a really fascinating confluence of things. When I looked 10 years ago, uh, I could just see actually the beginning of, of what was going on. So NASA's um, encouragement of commercial cargo had an enormous impact because uh, there started to be a regular train going to space that people could hop on with smaller experiments. And that was really valuable. Um, but SpaceX actually played a huge role too. What ended up happening was we shifted from what I call the vicious cycle to the virtuous cycle. So the vicious cycle was uh, rockets um, blow up occasionally. And in the 90s, we had a string of, of uh, rocket failures. So uh, people who designed satellites said, wow, um, this is pretty risky. Um, I'm not going to get a second chance. So if I get to space, I need to have high levels of redundancy so that when I'm there, I can operate for very long periods of time because this is just super risky. And uh, at the same time, rockets, a lot of effort was made to make them safer, which made them more expensive. So then because they got expensive, those satellite builders were like, wow, I really can't afford a second launch. I better pile everything onto my satellite that I can. More redundancy. The satellites got more expensive. Then the rockets got more expensive. The satellites got heavier. The rockets had to get uh, more expensive to accommodate that. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely in a downward spiral. And the United States mm -hmm. lost market share of launches um, in the world and um, had virtually no commercial launches. Uh, around two th by 2010. SpaceX came along, they used government technology, so it wasn't any magic secret sauce that Elon mm -hmm. thought up. He took rocket uh, technologies, but he applied different manufacturing techniques from the automotive industry and said, we're gonna be you know, robotics, we're gonna have a, uh, an assembly line, we're gonna take technologies that were developed by the government, make them more efficient and more commercial, and really undercut that price. At the same time, on the satellite side, Moore's law was affecting the size uh, and weight of electronics. And bringing the capability to do actually significant things in space, from communications and remote sensing, down to a much smaller form factor. Smaller satellite, cheaper to build, cheaper to launch. So now we have a virtuous cycle of lower launch cost, lower satellite costs, well, gee, maybe, maybe if I lose a satellite or two, it's not a big deal because I can get on the next freight train to space, and so I'm going to make a less expensive satellite, and I'm going to just try new things and experiment. And what we've seen is a, an absolute explosion of innovation, both uh, from a technology standpoint, but also from commercial business standpoint, because all of a sudden, it, it makes sense. And what about, I've read about heavy manufacturing in space. Yes, I think that is going to be transformative when it comes. It is still extremely difficult to do. I can tell you, having operated the robotic arm in space yes. and uh, done rendezvous and proximity operations, um, it is absolutely possible to do, but it is, uh, it's, it's pretty arcane uh, area that there's not a lot of expertise in still. So. Uh, I personally think that uh, robotics and rendezvous are going to be the two things that allow us uh, to start manufacturing our own satellites in space, and then you don't have to worry about launch at all. Uh, after all, there are a lot of dead satellites up there, and it's going to be really interesting, because right now, we're all very worried about space junk in low Earth orbit. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, yeah, we're all very worried about it. But if we get this technology figured out, all of a sudden, 
all the stuff you need in space is actually going to be there, and you just need to go collect it to build new things. Fascinating. So who's the leader in all this? Ooh. Who should we be? Any companies we should be wow. watching in all yeah, of that? Yeah, there's so, um, Maxar has been pushing on the robotics side. Maxar? Maxar, yeah, okay. yeah. And um, they have been pushing on this idea for a while. But um, um, Northrop Grumman is also working in this area and a few others. But it is, um, actually NASA and DARPA are leading the way right now. Oh, they are, okay. Um, I was going to go into the Space Force. Do we have other, um, I, I want to get into the militarization and yeah. Space Force, but I also want to just stick with the kind of space exploration for a minute. So let me see what our audience has to offer on that. Um, what are your thoughts on export controls that impact the ability of American aerospace sector to internationally be competitive? Oh boy, that's a fun one. Just say export control in a room full of space people <laughs> and watch their heads explode. Um, it's, it's a really big issue. And um, I think the complexity around it is um, we have to recognize that uh, technology is uh, global now. I mean, the internet um, has allowed people access to technology and moving very quickly. Uh, in areas, uh, it's, it's not, it, it's very difficult to protect um, any, any kind of technology anymore. I mean, if you look at software, for example, um, intellectual property, it's kind of ridiculous, right? So the perfect example is Uber and Lyft, right? So Uber developed an app, uh, software, right? So did Lyft violate their, I oh no, it was a different, completely different algorithm. So when you look at it in, in that perspective, this idea of um, protection, it's, it's making less and less sense. I think that there is some uh, very special secret sauce that still does need to be protected. But right now, it is just limiting US uh, companies, I think, from competing globally. Um, one other question I just thought of when you're talking about lowering the cost, one of the things that private, the private sector also seems to have contributed is the reuse of vehicles, mm -hmm. right? Isn't that a big thing pushing us forward? Well, there was this fabulous reusable spaceship for a long time. It was called the space shuttle. Right. And um, yet at the same time, uh, this was of course, you know, developed early on. It also wasn't used the way it was designed. Um, it had, you know, three fault tolerant failure systems, but uh, you had a single failure and you pretty much came home. And, and so I don't think we used it the same way and it took about four months to recycle the shuttle every single time. Um, there are real problems actually with reusable vehicles because uh, um, uh, eventually you get to the point where you're, you don't have an open production line. So if you have a vendor that's building a part like the tires for the space shuttle, if they go out of business, you're, you're done. So there's some advantages to um, expendable systems. And so I think the world is getting a little more sophisticated and looking at ways where uh, an, uh, reusability for a certain period of time, and then but, but keeping a production line open as well. And I think that's what you're seeing. Um, that, to me, what is the nut that um, SpaceX has cracked. Sounds like they've cracked a lot. Um, there are not a lot of regulations for emerging space tech or space tourism. How does the government promote innovation but ensure safety with new tech? And by the way, the, this issue that we were talking about, about um, tourists, mm -hmm. um, talk about that as well. You and I were talking. Yeah, it's, uh, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, there is a moratorium on uh, the commercial space regulator in the United States, which happens to be the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation, is not allowed to regulate the safety of uh, humans in space. Uh, and that is in order to promote innovation and uh, not over-regulate um, before we've actually had Tourists flying, I mean. So no one regulates the safety of humans? Uh, the safety of third parties is regulated. So 
Uh, for example, you have to meet a minimum standard of safety for your vehicle so that it doesn't fall apart and hit some innocent bystander on the head. Okay. But the people on board the vehicle, sorry, it, you're on your own. And uh, like if you've paid, you've you know you've bought yeah, your seat, you're yeah. a, a space tourist, so to speak. You are right. on your own. It, yes, okay. and you know clearly it's in the best interests of these companies to do the very best that they can. But um, for example, you are not allowed to call those people passengers, because passengers implies a level of safety in a branch of transportation law called common carriage. So if you get on the metro. You, are, uh, you, you can s expect a certain minimum level of safety, and that is the way public transportation works. This does not fall into that category. You are a space flight participant, uh, and you um, are accepting the fact that there is no minimum standard of safety that anybody is, is uh, guaranteeing. That's fascinating. Yeah. Do you think that'll change? Oh yeah, yeah. For, we see. Well, we're we're, we're going to see a lot of rich people fly, and somebody's going to get unhappy, and um, and come up against this. What and happens we'll see. When, when something happens to one of those? Oh, rich they'll people. sue. But then, then, and and then what you're going to start to see is some case law built up around it, which we don't have right now, of course. And we've got the Japanese billionaire bringing his girlfriend now. I, think. I heard that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Um, and what about other kinds of regulation, um, you know, on sp space technology, on this space technology? Is there anything we should keep an eye out on what, what's needed? Yeah, the space, um, I talked about space debris, um, and increasingly we're using words about space traffic management. So as you see um, vehicles that don't just launch into space and stay in one orbit for their entire lifetime, as we talk about things like rendezvous and maneuvering uh, and, and, and things like that, going transiting beyond uh, the geosynchronous uh, belt where a lot of really high value assets are on your way to the moon and back, um, as, as you begin to see that, we really need to be managing that. But unfortunately, there's a disagreement right now. The White House has uh, placed responsibility for this on the Department of Commerce. But Congress is split between Department of Transportation and Commerce. And as I have often said, we are in the worst possible place where we have no one in charge. So interesting. not That's a good place to be. Here's a, a somewhat related and fascinating question. At some point, more astronauts will be employed by a commercial private company mm -hmm. than for NASA slash the government. Please comment about the cultural view we will take when we reach that point. Look, how will that change the yeah, culture? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the way I look at that, actually I'm really excited about more humans flying in space. We have a lot to learn. Um, but I look at it the same way I look at, because uh, my background is aviation. And uh, I, I do have a private and a commercial pilot's license, but I'm also a military aviator. So as we look at the ecosystem of aviation in the world, um, there is room in this world for a joint strike fighter, um, and there is room in this world for um, a uh, triple seven. Uh, there's room in this world for a Cessna. And so, and we actually all have a vision how we view uh, the people who either fly or uh, are passengers on each one of those. And uh, so I think that's the framework I think we're gonna expect going forward. I think what you'll see is government astronauts will be the ones pushing the boundaries the hardest, um, going out into deep space for the first time, doing a lot of things for the first time. And, um, and that is you know, an analogy more to uh, government aviation, military aviation. So where is Wellesley College 98? Pause. <laughs> Just wanted to point this right. out. Do you have, Mister. so here's a related question. Do you yeah. have concerns, Wellesley College? Yes. Um, do you have concerns regarding the private government relationship in its current trajectory? Actually, I really don't have any concerns. Um, I think the uh, significant impact that NASA has had on developing commercial space um, is so productive and it's so healthy. And I actually see that innovation cycling back and forth. And a great example of that is uh, the commercial space companies taking astronauts to the space station said, look, we don't, we don't think this three-day rendezvous thing is going to work. We're going to have to keep people alive for three days. Why can't we just dock on the day we launch? 
And um, you know, it uses up a little more propellant, but it's easier on the life support system. And so now you see uh, government, including Russia, docking on the, on the day of launch, which is something that we didn't used to do. So you mm -hmm. see that, that innovation cycling mm -hmm. back and forth and those, those uh, fresh ideas actually going back and forth. And I feel really good actually about that relationship right now. Um, and again, a related question. Are you seeing any changes in the composition of the workforces of new space agencies and commercial companies? And I would say, um, I would if you could also address women. Yeah. Are, we, are there more opportunities for women? Are you seeing um, are you seeing universities catching on to this and training people in that direction? So take that as broadly as you like. Right. I would say um, the composition of the workforce in commercial industry. Uh, probably the most exciting thing is uh, it's been a worry for a long time about aerospace, the graying of the workforce. Um, so we have a little bit of a bathtub. We have uh, sort of the you know old heads, um, but increasingly what we're seeing is a very large surge of uh, younger people entering the industry. So that is a really positive development. I think um, they bring fresh ideas um, and a lot of energy and a lot of that aspirational thinking, the why not, you know, ideas. Um, as far as gender parity. It's pretty complicated. You know, if you go and take a look at universities, um, there are more women in universities than men. Um, but the numbers are still not great in STEM fields. And I think you're seeing that uh, translate out into the workforce. And then, of course, at the highest levels, um, there are still issues. I'd like to take the opportunity to mention the fact that there's also a real problem if you are a senior woman or a person of color both in industry and in academia, and to some extent government. And it's an extra burden that is put upon you uh, to help. And so what that means is uh, you're disproportionately called upon to sit on uh, personnel selections, uh, task forces. Um, they want you out front to be seen, and that, that's well, more of a Well, I think fair enough. Yeah. You want their, uh, a diverse voice to be heard yeah. when key decisions are being made. But if you don't have very many women and people of color in those senior positions, they end up with this uh, burden and this expectation of non-work related or nothing related to their jobs um, that they're supposed to be involved in. And um, I think it's... it's um, I'm really worried about that, actually. I mean, I certainly have, have felt it. I have been asked to be on so many things and do so much pro bono work, especially. Um, you know, and they say, well, but it'll be so wonderful. And I'm like, yeah, how, I also got a job and I have to do my own work. And when everything is wonderful, you actually have to pick between the most wonderful things yeah. to do. Well, we appreciate you giving us this pro bono moment. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Okay, this um, this uh, audience member is is challenging your Mars prognosis. Yeah. Tesla's been on a surge, and Elon has netted three billion dollars in the last two weeks. Isn't twenty twenty two more realistic than one would think? Ah, uh, it's just more about the technology. I mean, the the things that you have to do to prove it. I, I mean, I love that idea of push, 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 and that's what I love about 2024, Boots on the Moon as well. Um, it's the idea that you set yourself that aspirational goal, but it does actually take time to build this hardware and test it. Even if you're Elon Musk. Even if you're Elon Musk. As we learned with the Tesla. Yeah, yeah. and so <laughs> the other thing is that Mars is staggeringly complicated from the standpoint, of, like for example, there's no possible way to communicate except through the deep space network, <laughs> which is mean? owned by NASA. So if you're way out that way, believe me, your radio signal is very faint. And so uh, even just having a satellite dish, or a big a dish on the ground that can pick up that signal, NASA owns that, that the most powerful system for deep space. So if Elon was going to go to Mars, he'd have to either figure out how to recreate all that infrastructure, but more than likely he's going to get help from NASA. And there are lots of bits and pieces like that that you don't think about. So I think that's, um, that's really the, to, you know, to me, um, 
to, to me, the challenge, it doesn't mean something won't happen in 2022. I think something will happen. Just not sure it's exactly what he says it's going to be. And the, and the six months getting there, obviously, right. has its own has, complications. It has an impact. <laughs> yes, yeah. it does. There are, uh, because of the orbits, uh, six months is actually the fastest you can do it in if the orbital mechanics is not good. Uh, and just picture the Earth being on the opposite side of the sun from Mars versus the same side of the sun. Very, very simple. Uh, and they're also moving at the same time. Um, it can be nine months or even longer. So here's another very good question. What role will God and religion play in the exploration and colonization of space? Do you think that'll reshape views? It, I think... Uh, that is a really fascinating question to me. I will say that um, this perspective about the Earth being a spaceship and that we are it, uh, her crew um, is one that most astronauts share. Um, in fact, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say any differently. Um, there's also famously some astronauts who went to the moon and back who came up with um, you know, very strong spiritual feelings. Um, there is no doubt that leaving Mother Earth is going to create uh, spiritual thoughts. One of the things that's challenging is that astronauts are operators and engineers and scientists. And so I'm, although many, including Chris Hadfield, who's a wonderful musician, um, although many have other skills, I'm excited about seeing more humans uh, be able to articulate some of the things that those of us who are engineers and pilots might struggle to do. And I think there will be a huge impact. A one one um, astronaut I talked to, um, Anusha, mm -hmm. um, said looking at the Earth reminds you how unified we need to be. Yes. Because, as yes. you say, we're yes. a vulnerable yes. little. But, you know, also if we have a Mars colony that is largely out of touch with the Earth, will they not develop their own culture? Right? How is that going to, yeah, it's fascinating to think about the sociological implications. What, what, what's the talk about how, how large a space colony on Mars would be? Like what, what numbers of people Ooh, are we talking about? Yeah, I think it's going to be, it's going to be short trips for a long time. Uh, but eventually you will be able to build up the logistics train. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's going to look a lot more like Antarctica for a period of time where um, it's a fairly small population doing science. Um, but eventually that's going to change. Um, this audience member, how much, I would worry about, we have five minutes. We do yeah. have to ask you about Space Force. Um, there's so many good questions to ask you. So if we get time after Space Force, I'll do this. Um, yay or nay on having a Space Force? And what is your concern about potential militarization of space. Wow, so um, Space Force has been discussed by the space policy community since the 80s and maybe even a little bit before that. Uh, so it is a little bit lost in some of the memes and the, uh, the jokes and so forth, um, but uh, the, the importance of it I think is very high. Um, People don't fully appreciate that uh, Russia and China have already organized um, in a fashion, made, made their own space forces. France is talking about it now. Um, so I think, um, you know, I view it as not a change in what we are already doing in space uh, militarily, but instead to uh, concentrate a group of people who are actually technical experts in space and also, um, give them um, the cultural mandate to develop doctrine and to, uh, to you know, understand how, you know, what, how the military uses space. I mean, there are lots of people who are smart, but when it's a part of the Air Force, uh, there are people who rotate back and forth between the air and the space side. I think it's, it, it never really got the level of attention from the, um, the highest levels of the Air Force because there were other things that had more priority that were on the aviation side. Uh, so I think it's actually a really important step. The big challenge is that it needs to stay lean. Um, uh, you know, I view it as a startup inside government. Hmm. And as long as uh, that approach is taken, I think it's gonna be very successful at uh, bringing a group of people together who are experts and, uh, and really understand it. 
And do you worry about conflict in space? I'm very worried about conflict in space, but unfortunately, um, I kind of joke, everything goes from zero to classified in under a second in space. And so there's a lot of things that are not discussed um, that are disturbing, but um, the things that are known, uh, you know, China, uh, anti-satellite missiles, India most recently um, shot off an anti-satellite missile. Um, I think there are things that we really do need to be worried about. And so having our story straight um, and having, having a plan, um, and especially for me, watching the barriers crumble between civil, military and commercial space in terms of an integrated strategy for our country is incredibly important. So um, as we finish up here with all these great questions, you can take home and answer. Mm -hmm. Like I apologize I didn't get to all of them because they really were good questions. Um, tell us what excites you most what, what, and what the world is gonna look like in 2050 wow. in space. Yeah, I'll, I don't know if I can go all the way to 2050, but I will say uh, that I do expect um, commercial to have a very powerful role in space transportation. And uh, I forecast that to be everything from commercial point-to-point suborbital transportation. So uh, personally, I would enjoy going Washington to Sydney in 45 minutes instead of, you know, 25 hours. Uh, I, I, it will affect us here on so Earth. it'll affect us. It'll affect Absolutely. Our, it'll affect airline you travel. You bet. That's interesting. And, okay. uh, and then, uh, again, robust transportation to low Earth orbit. Um, I think that we're going to see um, the way that we look at sort of commercial aviation today, where uh, you have sort of a hub and spoke system, you have a few major airports and then regional airports, uh, and the same thing is true of ports and things like that. So you're going to see low Earth orbit be one sort of a hub. Uh, you're going to see lunar orbit be another sort of transportation hub, possibly the Lagrange points, which is a stable point um, relative to uh, the Earth and the, and the Moon or the Earth and the Sun uh, that you can set up as a, as a transition point for hopping out. And so um, once we begin to get that logistics train going back and forth, um, that's when you're going to see real progress. We're going to see people, we're going to see science, uh, and even whole new societies forming on the moon and Mars. And it will become as easy to go to space as it is today to buy a plane ticket. Wow. Okay, on those words, thank you. That was just such an incredibly um, powerful uh, discussion and conversation about this transformative era that we're in. Thank mm -hmm. you so much, Colonel Melroy. Thank, thank you, Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Great question.